Up next, two people are attacked, only one survives. This is a very violent crime. The fact that he ran out of the apartment, left her there, it just looks suspicious. Are you saying I did it? I'm saying it certainly looks like it. They just had no idea who did it. I think everybody was a suspect. Until a partial bloody fingerprint finally helps identify the killer. We knew that it did come from the suspect, and uh, that was a really key piece of evidence. After graduating from college in 2004, Jonna Berry set her sights on being a lawyer. She was the youngest girl ever accepted into law school in Michigan. She thought she wanted to go into law. But after a few weeks, Jonna decided that being a lawyer wasn't for her. The academically gifted 21-year-old decided to be a child psychologist. She loved any child. She babysat and kept kids, and her life revolved around children. Though this was an easy decision professionally, it was a tough one personally. Jonna left her fiancé in Michigan and moved back to Tennessee. Jonna and her fiancé talked every night on the phone. He was in Michigan, a law student. Both had such big plans, and they talked every night until John would fall asleep, which was kind of sweet. Once she decided to move, Jonna reached out to an old friend from her undergraduate days, Jason A. Mummy. He had an extra bedroom, and uh, he invited her to share the rent with him until she could find her own apartment. Jason's girlfriend was also friends with Jonna, so they all knew each other from college. Shortly before dawn, on a December morning, Jonna's roommate, Jason, said he awoke to find a knife-wielding man in their apartment. He confronted the man, who stabbed him repeatedly. Jason, spattered with blood, ran out the front door and into a convenience store down the street, where he yelled for the clerk to call 911. Knox County 911. There's a man that just walked in the store. He's heavily bloodied. He's been, looks like he's been in a fight. Is he in an ambulance? His roommate's still in there. Apparently somebody broke into his house. Okay, can I talk to him, please? Okay. Uh, now, what happened? Um, uh, we're both sleeping. Uh, I just felt somebody stab me right in my chest. Somebody stabbed you? Yeah. in my face. And the first thing I did was get up and run. Okay, what about your roommate? Is he okay? Uh, just a she, and she was screaming very loud. Okay. I didn't have any time. I just got out of there. First responders arrived to find Jonna Berry face down near the front door of her apartment building, covered in blood. She was semi-conscious. She couldn't respond to any of their questions, but she'd obviously been stabbed multiple times. She had stab wounds just about all over her, every part of her body, head, face, neck, some on her back. She had some defensive wounds. Jonna died shortly after arriving at the emergency room. She'd been stabbed more than 20 times. There was no sign of sexual assault. Her roommate, Jason, suffered nine mostly superficial stab wounds. And one wound on his right hand raised all sorts of questions for investigators. The cut on Jason Amami's hand was extremely suspicious because it's a type of cut that is very common with knife slippage. During an attack, if you're sweaty or bloody, that slipperiness allows the hand to slip from the handle part of the knife onto the blade. The wound to Jason's hand was far from the only thing that was suspicious. There was no sign of forced entry. The murder weapon was a kitchen knife from inside the apartment. And that many wounds often indicates a prior relationship between the victim and the killer. Jason being in the same apartment with her. His wounds not being as severe as Jonna's. It led us to believe, did he have something to do with this in some way? She didn't have any enemies, none. I guess at, at that time I thought, could he have done this? There were three blood trails at the scene of Jonna Berry's murder. One 
out the back door and two out the front. There was blood on doors of other apartments and investigators realized she had gone to every apartment after having been stabbed 26 times, banging on the door or at least pushing on the door, trying to get help as best she could and no one answered. Jonna's family, in shock when informed of her murder, told police they had no idea who would want her dead. You don't know what to do. You have no clue what you're supposed to do. There's nothing you're supposed to do in a situation like that. It was just a tragic, unbelievable thing, and uh, I don't think I had myself together, you know, at that time. Jonna's fiancé was confirmed to be in Michigan at the time of the murder and was never a suspect. All attention now turned to Jonna's roommate, Jason Amami. Um, I came home from the gym, and the door was locked. I had to put my key in and unlock the door. He walked detectives through the crime scene. I came back here to go to bed after coming from the bathroom. I put my alarm clock to 5.30. He told them that he went to bed at midnight and woke up hours later when he heard Jonna screaming. He said that Jonna has a history of sleepwalking, uh, sometimes even maybe having nightmares. Uh, he thought that was what was going on. Jason, whose bedroom was right next to Jonna's, said he got up to check on her. Jason said when he opened his bedroom door, he was confronted by a male that was walking out of or backing out of Jonna's bedroom. He pushed me back this way and I fell on the bed like this. Hard shove? Yeah, it was fairly hard shove. I remember hitting my head right here. He said the male started stabbing him. He kind of balled up in a fetal position to protect himself, try and protect himself from the stabbing. He said he ended up kicking the individual kind of in the uh, growing area, kicked him back off of him. I took off and I ran as fast as I could this way. The question now was whether Jason's story would match up with the other evidence at the scene. A partial bloody fingerprint was recovered from the blade of the murder weapon. They weren't able to successfully remove that fingerprint. What they were able to do was to take high-resolution photographs of the fingerprint. But even with this high-quality photograph, the print was too partial and too blood-smeared to be entered into the APHIS database. In Jason's bedroom, investigators found a partial shoe print in blood. A small piece of cardboard that had been left there where he had purchased some dress shirts. We knew that it could possibly came from the suspect. Detectives sent the shoe print to the FBI, which maintains the largest shoe print database in the world. Nicknamed Soul Searcher, some 30,000 images are on file. Unlike APHIS, the fingerprint database or IBIS, a ballistics database, Soul Searcher looks for shapes rather than attempting a direct comparison. The footwear database here, we are not looking to identify a particular shoe. We are trying to compare and determine general brand or uh, make of that shoe. It works by comparing different characteristics on the sole of the shoe. Some of those shapes might be circles, some of them might be squares or rectangles, layered rectangles, zigzags, wave patterns. And you can specify where on that impression if you know. If you have a heel, you can specify that that particular circle is on the heel. When the print from Jonna's crime scene was entered, the database returned 32 potential matches. I was able to quickly scan through and determine that there was only one possibility, and that was the Faded Glory Ganon. The shoe was sold exclusively by Walmart, which narrowed things down, but still meant a lot of possibilities. As detectives attempted to run them down, and as blood at the scene was being analyzed for DNA, investigators asked Jason Amami to take a polygraph test, and he agreed. It didn't go well. Then tell me why you failed that. I Tell have me. no idea. Why and you didn't fail it. You, you didn't come close. I, I have no idea at all. Jason became really irate uh, with the proligrapher. I don't care what that box says. I voluntarily took this. If I had something to hide, why would I take this test? I live my life in fear knowing this guy is still out there. I closed my... Was Jason lying or was he what he claimed to be? Another victim of the crime. 
With so much blood at the scene, detectives hoped the DNA would reveal the answer. DNA testing on blood at Jonna Berry's crime scene revealed profiles from three people. Jonna, her roommate Jason Amami, who said he was wounded at the scene, and a third profile from an unknown male. It was found on the knife. It was found on the doorknob leading out the back door of the apartment, and the droplets of blood led down the back stairwell. The finding of blood from an unknown male meant Jason had been telling the truth all along. Another unknown man had shed blood in the apartment. So how had Jason failed the polygraph? It turned out the person administering the test not only ignored a series of standard protocols, he misread the results. The results were looked at again. Uh, It was revealed that he did indeed pass that test. I don't have a dog in this fight. All I'm trying to determine is the truth. I have told you the 100% true. It wasn't really the polygrapher's place to confront the person that was taking the test. That's supposed to be left up to the detective that's working the case. Jason immediately went from chief suspect to chief witness. His description of the killer was run through a computer. The information was refined by a technician until Jason signed off on this image. He described the person as uh, 5'8", uh, stocky, 180 pounds, white male. But more specifically, he was able to indicate that he had teardrop or pecan-shaped eyes that uh, the composite really highlighted. We aired it almost every night in the hopes of trying to find who did this to Jonna. This is who sheriff's investigators are trying to identify. He's in his 20s, about 5 feet 8 inches tall, 150 pounds. And that led to a lot of tips. As those tips were tracked down, detectives, hopeful the DNA would expose the killer, were dealt a setback. The CODIS database did not reveal the identity of the unknown male. The CODIS database doesn't contain juveniles and it doesn't contain people who haven't been convicted of crime so we knew that we were dealing with somebody who was a rather novice in terms of committing crimes finally one of the tips appeared to be solid the potential suspect was a 19 year old named michael percival percival lived about two miles away from the crime scene and he was active in some criminal activity burglaries and things of that nature when detectives went to pick him up he was barefoot He asked a detective to get his shoes. That detective retrieved the shoes. She punched me in the arm and her eyes were kind of the size of saucers. We both couldn't believe it because those shoes were an actual pair of faded Glory Gannon shoes. The tread on the bottom appeared to be the same as what was left behind at the crime scene on the uh, cardboard in Jason Amemi's bedroom. It looked like investigators had found their man. A theory only confirmed after Percival was in custody. And he indicated that he, in fact, had been present when John Berry was killed, that he had gone over to John's house with another person, that that person had gone in the back and had committed the stabbing. But parts of Percival's story didn't add up. He claimed he forced himself into John's apartment with a crowbar, which was clearly not true. His shoes, while the same make and st- as the shoe print at the scene were not an exact match. The FBI concluded that that shoe had a different wear pattern than the shoes that had left the bloody shoe print in Jason Amami's bedroom. And in a development beyond dispute, his DNA did not match DNA from the unidentified male. Percival had duped investigators who lost precious time investigating his story. We kind of learned that Michael was not attention seeker, that he was trying to put himself in the middle of this for attention to be involved in this crime in some way. That was very upsetting to know that someone would would say that they committed a, a horrible crime like this and not have done it. Even worse, the investigation was now back to square one and was growing colder by the day. Jonna's family put up a 
$70,000 reward. Anything to keep it in the public's eye was the only way we figured our daughter's murder would ever be caught. Whatever opportunity we had, we would do it. We had billboards, anything that we could do. The case looked like it might go unsolved. But then, some two years after Jonna's murder, a suspect with an incredible resemblance to the composite sketch finally emerged. Jonna Barry's family seized every opportunity to keep her case alive. This computer-generated composite sketch was a regular sight in Knoxville. In June of 2007, an anonymous tipster told police they should check out 22-year-old Taylor Olson. Taylor Olson had a juvenile record. He was known for breaking into cars, nothing major, but enough to have police and sheriff's officers know who he was. Taylor Olson was not somebody that we would say by looking at his rap sheet that he was uh, conclusively the killer. By this time, two years had passed, and it was unlikely that whoever killed Jonna still had the shoes that left the bloody shoe print at the scene. Taylor Olson didn't, but he did own a pair when Jonna was killed. Taylor's mother and ex-girlfriend identified those shoes. They said, hey, he doesn't have them anymore, but he once wore them. In fact, he wore them at the time of Jonna's murder. Detectives got Taylor Olson's DNA and soon afterward got a stunning call from the lab. The DNA of the unidentified man who left a trail of blood in Jonna's apartment had finally been identified. When we got the phone call that we had gotten a match on the unknown DNA sample, it was a shock. It was unbelievable, couldn't believe it. We had finally gotten somebody that was responsible for, for the murder. In September of 2007, Taylor Olson was arrested for Jonna's murder. His hand showed a couple of linear scars of the type made by a knife. He still denied any involvement. I can't believe that y'all come in my blood's there. That my blood's all down this knife and like, how the f- did we get there? Oh, you got there because you were there. He still says, there's no way I wasn't there. My DNA's not there. Y'all made a mistake. Eventually, Olson admitted he was in the area that night, looking for open apartments to steal keys to a car. He said Jonna's back door was unlocked. He entered and eventually made his way to her bedroom. According to Olson, Jonna attacked him with a knife, and he simply defended himself. I freaked out, and I just, I don't know, and I can't believe this happened. You got the knife away from that person and just... Went kind of crazy. Yeah. I guess they were sleeping with it. (laughs) Prosecutors didn't buy the story. They believe Olsen found the apartment's back door open and picked up a knife as he searched for something to steal. He went into Jonna's bedroom. Startled, she woke up and confronted him. Olsen apparently panicked and frantically stabbed her over and over. His hand slipped on the bloody knife, cutting him. He began shedding blood. He left Jonna's room and was met by Jason Amami, who he also attacked, creating even more blood evidence. He left a bloody shoe print on the piece of cardboard on Jason's floor. His DNA was on the murder weapon and in the blood trail he created as he escaped out the back door. His prints were ultimately matched back to the partial print on the bloody knife. Taylor Olson didn't know Jonna. Investigators have no explanation for the level of violence with which he attacked her. After his arrest, even he seemed at a loss for an explanation. Did you mean to kill her? Was it an accident? But you stabbed her 26 times. How can you say it was an accident? He could have left. He didn't have to just keep on and on stabbing at, you know, stabbing her. And he didn't have to do that. No, it wasn't no accident. In March of 2008, as the day of his trial approached, Taylor Olson was found dead in his jail cell. So he hung himself in Knox County Jail. It's called a coward's admission of guilt. 
I'm thankful that I had Jonna for 21 years. I'd rather have had her for 21 years than to never have had her at all. So I'm very grateful for that. But at the same time, I'm also mad that she was taken away. The Barry family created a support group called Hope for Victims. They also work to change state laws to allow for collection of DNA from anyone arrested for a violent crime. Law enforcement can only do so much. They can, you know, they can only work with the tools that they have, and they need better tools to work with. That one little hit on the DNA for the blood, that solved the whole case. It takes all the question out. The forensic evidence was critical to the resolution of this case. There would be no case if Taylor Olson hadn't bled and he'd gotten away. If he hadn't have been injured during the attack, uh, this case would have never been solved. Up next, two high school sweethearts celebrate Valentine's Day. They were just a real all-American couple. That night, they're victims of a brutal attack. Scared the family so much that they started locking up their children. The way that she was taken from us made it even worse. Generations of detectives attempt to identify a killer. It was a big case, and many people tried to solve it. And then a new forensic test reaches across time to solve the mystery. I was hearing the last name of our killer, something that detectives have been wanting to hear for the last 46 years. In 1974, America was near the end of the Vietnam War, and Richard Nixon was in the final throes of Watergate. But that didn't register all that much with Carla Walker and Rodney McCoy. Their main interest was each other. Carla was very, very in love with Rodney, and he was in love with her as well. And none of her friends or family talked about her even being interested in anybody else. Rodney was the captain of the football team. He was the quarterback. Carla was on the cheer squad. They were the kind of couple that everybody at high school kind of knew of them. On a cold February night, Carla and Rodney were going to a Valentine's Day dance at Western Hills High School outside Fort Worth, Texas. She never missed a dance. They went to all the dances and did all kind of school activities like that. Rodney was especially looking forward to the evening. He had a surprise in store for Carla. He gave her a promise ring that evening before they left for the dance. So that promise ring also kind of made that night extra special for the two of them. After the dance, at about one o'clock in the morning, the couple stopped at a local bowling alley. Carla had just gone to the restroom at the bowling alley. They came back to the car and they were doing what couples do, which is make out in the car. They've been dating for a year and they're making out in the front seat of the car. Sounds familiar. All of a sudden, the passenger side door of Rodney's car was ripped open. A stunned Carla nearly tumbled onto the ground. Then, the man who opened the car door started dragging her away. Rodney tried to get her back into the car. The attacker pulled out a gun and tried to kill him. A stranger actually puts the gun to Rodney's face and pulls the trigger three times. Incredibly, the gun misfired, so the attacker used his weapon to hit Rodney repeatedly. Despite this beating and in shock from nearly being shot to death, Rodney still attempted to save Carla. But Carla apparently realized that this was no robbery. The attacker was after her. Carla was saying, I'll go with you, just stop hitting him. And so that's exactly what had happened. Rodney later told police he passed out from the blows to his head. Once he regained consciousness, he did exactly what Carla told him to do. He drove to her house. Carla's brother remembers the night. I heard boom, 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 pounding on our front door. Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker, help me. They've got her. They're going to hurt her bad. I know they are. It made an impression in my life at 12 years old. Rodney he was emotional. I mean, he was just kind of like, you know, they got her, they got her, and he was bleeding. Rodney was able to describe the suspect. Uh, that evening, he described him as a medium build, a white male with 
wavy hair, had a cowboy hat on, and he also stated that he talked with a Western uh, or cowboy accent. At the scene was a bullet magazine with bullets still inside from a Ruger Mark I 22 caliber pistol. The only sign of Carla at the scene was her purse. Oddly, even though it was late at night, it was a busy area and there wasn't a single eyewitness, except for Rodney, which had investigators questioning whether they should treat him as a victim or a possible suspect. Most murders are going to be committed by people that you know. Nobody wanted to believe that Rodney was involved, but he always was a question mark. In the 1970s, Fort Worth, Texas had its fair share of crime, but violent crime was a rarity, which had many people, including Carla Walker's sister, hopeful she was found alive. I still thought she would be dropped off. Somebody would drop her off. I just never thought it would end like it did at all. Three days after her abduction, Carla's partially clothed body was found in a drainage culvert just outside the city. Carla's brother, Jim, remembers getting the news. I remember looking at my dad and my mom, expressionless. Never saw my dad cry once, all my years. He was looking straight ahead, straight ahead. Uh, his eyes teared up, and I think that was the point I started getting angry. It was clear this was a sexually motivated crime. The medical examiner found what looked to be seminal fluid in 1974. Testing was not quite as available as it was now, so we know for sure what happened, but at the time, the testing was a little less exacting. She had quite a bit of bruising and scratching on her body. During the autopsy, it was determined that she had been strangled. Investigators turned to their only witness, Carla's boyfriend, Rodney McCoy. And we understand that you, always, you know, the boyfriend, the one who's with her, is always the first suspect. Rodney appeared traumatized, but there were questions. He had sustained no life-threatening injuries. He claimed a gun placed to his head misfired three times. And for reasons no one could explain, Carla's promise ring, the one Rodney gave her just a few hours before she was killed, had apparently been pulled off her finger and left at the scene of her murder. And to this day, we don't know how that ended up there, if, if it was purposely taken or if it was removed in a struggle. Despite these questions, no one who knew this young couple thought Rodney could possibly have harmed Carla. My parents loved Rodney like a son. I mean, he was able to just come in and out of the house. He didn't have to knock. He'd go in the kitchen, fix himself something to eat or drink. Detectives now turn to their only piece of solid evidence, the bullet magazine at the scene. The Ruger 22 Mark I model of gun that was used during this crime is unique in that it has a magazine release at the bottom of the grip. And so during the time that Rodney was in an altercation with the attacker and being pistol whipped, it appears that that magazine release was pushed and the magazine was released from the bottom of the gun. A partial print was lifted from the bullet magazine but it had so little detail, it could not identify a suspect. So detectives turned to the ATF to see who in Texas owned a 22 caliber Ruger Mark I pistol. It was a new gun. It had only been released for a little while. And so they had kind of a small window of people to look into, still hundreds of leads. While these gun owners questioned, detectives and even Carla's family were flooded with possible tips. The tips? information coming in. My parents would still get uh, phone calls and they would answer or somebody would just drop by and say, well, I know this or I heard this. And my, my parents would go investigate themselves. But it was an arrest nearly three months after Carla's murder that appeared to be the key break in the case. A 21-year-old, Tommy Ray Neeland, was arrested near Fort Worth for an attack that bore eerie similarities to Carla's case. Tommy Ray Neelan attempted to abduct and sexually assault a female, and she got away. And when they picked him up on that warrant, he confessed to killing two other people, a 15-year-old and a 17-year-old kid. 
And they thought, well, you know, he's in the area. He likes to kill kids. Maybe he killed Carla, too. When a suspect in Carla Walker's murder emerged in the person of self-confessed killer Tommy Ray Neeland, Neeland was placed in a police lineup. Carla's boyfriend, Rodney McCoy, was called in. They had Rodney McCoy present, and Rodney asked that they have each of the people in the lineup say, come with me. And when Neeland spoke, Rodney picked him. He was number three in the lineup, and Rodney picked him as the person who he believed to be the suspect. But Neeland, who freely confessed to three other murders, insisted he hadn't killed Carla. He claimed he was at a youth retreat the night of the murder, and other people confirmed he was there. But he failed a polygraph. So he remained a suspect that there was not enough evidence to arrest him for the crime. Years passed, but the work on Carla's case never flagged. It was just all legwork back then, all legwork and interviewing people and driving to other cities if they had information. It was just tips, tips from people. That's all they had to go on, really, was was tips. And as those tips dried up, detectives had to face the possibility that Carla's killer would never be caught. Carla's parents died while the case remained open, but her brother Jim, a man of deep faith, remained convinced the case would be solved. In fact, he was so hopeful he refused to sell the family home. I didn't want to sell the house and somebody be knocking at this door at three o'clock in the morning saying, hey, I got a story to tell you. I wanted to be here in case that happened. And they decided to come by and get this off of their chest. While Carla's family prayed that knock would come, forensic experts were revolutionizing crime science. Fort Worth detectives thought Carla Walker's case was a prime candidate for re-examination. One of the hardest parts about working a cold case is there's so many factors that work against you. You're working against um, witnesses who have, who have forgotten or witnesses who have died. But after all this time, was there any physical evidence left to test? It turned out there was plenty. The first time I went into the property room and looked at the property from Carla Walker, I remember turning to my investigator and saying, it's like they knew what DNA was. Because you got to remember, in 1974, no one tested for DNA. And so every single thing they did was done correctly. And they didn't even know it. Incredibly, Carla's clothing had been kept in storage for decades. A partial DNA profile from an unknown male was generated, but it was very weak. It's not enough to put in a code. And it's really only enough to um, exclude individuals. And so it's more of a working lead than it is something to clinch a suspect. So we had something to work with. We just didn't have enough. This partial profile eliminated potential suspects in the case, including Rodney McCoy and confessed killer Tommy Ray Nealon. To see what more information the DNA might provide, the profile was sent to the Serological Research Institute in Richmond. California, better known as Siri. They were able to replace elements of the profile that had degraded and produced a full DNA profile. That was extremely exciting to know that we had now had a full DNA profile. We were very hopeful that when it was uploaded into CODIS, that after this many years, that profile would be in CODIS. But it was not to be. In a shocking development, there were no hits. Incredibly unusual in a case with this type of Islands. We were pretty disappointed and felt like we had hit a brick wall. This was a setback, but also an opportunity. With this DNA profile in hand, detectives thought they might finally have a way to identify Carla's killer. We still had hope because we believed that there was somebody out there and we were definitely going to find out who it was. The full DNA profile recovered from Carla Walker's murder turned up no CODIS matches, but forensic analysts were not out of tools. In 2020, 
The profile was sent to Othram, the world's first private DNA laboratory devoted exclusively to identifying people by using old, damaged, or degraded DNA samples. We are able to enrich the DNA and work with amounts of DNA that are super, super low. We usually are the go-to when all other methods have failed and there is no more hope left for the case or for the family. Othram, their motto is justice through genomics, was perfect for this case because there was just a minuscule amount of fresh DNA, about one nanogram, left to test. We are able to work with quantities of DNA that are at 0.12 or 0.15 nanograms. That is equivalent to 15 human cells. And if I touch my body right now, um, I would leave hundreds of human cells. And so that should give you sort of a comparison as to what 0.12 nanograms of DNA looks like. Othram takes these tiny bits of DNA and amplifies them. They're not adding anything to the sample. Instead, they say they're enriching what's already there. Once this is done, they employ a process known as parallel DNA sequencing. We're able to look at tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of markers, and then later we use computational methods to put those fragments back together, and we're able to piece together the, the letter code that makes up your genome. Othram now tested the enriched DNA sample from Carla Walker's case against the huge amounts of DNA in a consumer DNA database known as GEDmatch. And this ultimately identified a family, the McCurleys. There were three brothers. One, Glenn, lived in Fort Worth at the time of Carla's murder. Every single time we're able to give an investigative lead that does lead to an investigation moving forward, it is the best feeling in the world, and it never changes. Despite all this time, Glenn McCurley's name was in the case file. Back in 1974, he'd been questioned after Carla's murder because he owned a 22 caliber Ruger Mark I pistol. In 1974, he was interviewed in April. He was killed in February. He said it was stolen while he was fishing. At the time, McCurley was put on the back burner because he'd passed a polygraph and had no violence in his record. Nearly a half century later, to the surprise of detectives, he still had no recorded incidents of violence. A long-haul trucker, he'd been married for more than 50 years and was the father of two children. Could the DNA be mistaken? There was only one way to find out. Detectives sifted through McCurley's trash, found a plastic straw, and lifted a genetic profile. It also matched the DNA from Carla's clothing. McCurley, 77 years old and unaware of the DNA evidence, was brought in for questioning and shown a picture of Carla Walker. Ms. McCurley, can you look at that picture and just tell us for sure that you do not know who she is? You've not had any contact with her? I've never seen her before. I don't know who she is. So you've never met her before, never seen her? I've never seen her, never met her, uh -huh. never talked to her. I wouldn't know her uh -huh. if she was standing beside him. When told that DNA tied him to Carla's murder, McCurley changed his story. He said he remembered seeing a man attacking Carla in a car that night. He said he pushed the man off of her and pulled her to safety. And later, he and Carla had consensual sex. I was just having sex with her. I didn't beat her up and just she was compliant and and grateful that I got her away from that guy. He started using words like she was compliant and that word I, the minute I heard that word in that interview it just sent chills to my stamp because I that is how a rapist talks she was compliant Finally, McCurley, apparently realizing the evidence was against him, confessed and ultimately pleaded guilty. After 47 agonizing years, the mystery of what happened to Carla Walker was finally solved. I remember Detective Bennett saying, we got him. I cried. And then I cried. Just, I just cried. And then I called uh, Rodney, I said, we got him. And there was a pause. And Rodney said, got him? 
And I said, yep, we got him, buddy. We know who did this to you and Carla. And Rodney started crying. So that was a good day. McCurley's confession and the evidence gives detectives a good idea of what happened that night. It was McCurley and his wife's 11th wedding anniversary, but the marriage was in trouble. He was angry. He was drunk. He saw Rodney and Carla making out in the bowling alley parking lot and, for reasons he has never explained, attacked them. Armed with the Ruger 22, he tried to pull Carla away. Rodney tried to keep her in the car and suffered a severe pistol whipping. Carla, realizing Rodney would likely get killed trying to defend her, left with McCurley. It was the last time she was seen alive. I believe Glenn McCurley was out hunting that night. And I don't uh, believe that this was the first time um, or the last time that he had committed an act of this type. In 2021, nearly a half century after Carla Walker's murder, Glenn McCurley got a sentence of life in prison. A community and a family suffered for decades. But a few microscopic clues at last told the story of what happened and finally provided some peace for the victims and for investigators. The technology gave us the critical lead, and then you still have to have amazing detectives like Leo Wagner and Jeff Bennett to push it over the line. It's a team effort. But the technology, thank you, God. This is something we hope becomes a standard. If something doesn't work with CODIS and CODIS doesn't have a match, then we hope that this type of testing is required because it is able to provide answers that CODIS alone is not. I think the science that was used in this case is bringing law enforcement into a new era of solving cases. And I think if you're a murderer that hasn't been caught, I would be worried if I were you. Up next, an independent-minded teenager goes out on her own. Leisha decided to be an adult and act like an adult, and she did. But she wasn't an adult, and that made her a target. Leisha's murder was heartbreaking and tragic. It totally and completely changed our lives. There are few clues, no witnesses, and lots of questions. This case sticks with me. You've got a young 16-year-old vibrant girl and then all of it taken away because of someone's selfish needs. Family members say that from the time she was a child, Leisha Schollmeyer showed a streak of independence they could barely contain. Leisha was the oldest child. I had her at a very young age, and as a result, I treated her more like a little sister, I think, than, than a daughter for a while. Leisha was not your typical teenager. She was like a mini mom, and she was my everything. Um, I was secure in this world with her. In 1977, Leisha was 16 and determined to strike out on her own. She got her own apartment in downtown Salt Lake City. I was married at 16, and I thought I was grown up, and I had a baby by the time I was 17. And I don't think she thought of it as being extraordinary that she would step out and, and start living her own life. I never doubted her ability to do it. She did call me every Thursday night at 7 o'clock to reassure me that she was okay and that, you know, everything was fine. But Leisha, living by herself, was not without problems. Someone broke into her apartment. She came home from work, and there was the door laying on the floor. She didn't have very many possessions, you can imagine. She Just a, a cheap little TV and a stereo. But she had a jar with her teeth in it, $50, and they had taken that. This robbery scared the normally fearless Leisha. 
She told my mom, I don't feel comfortable here. I want to get out. On a Saturday afternoon, Leisha and her mother looked for a new apartment. But on Monday, Leisha didn't show up for work, which was highly unusual. The employer for the restaurant where she was working were concerned and called her mother. So she contacted the apartment manager and asked to be let into the apartment. Lisa Schulmeyer was brutally strangled to death. She was placed in her bathtub, face down, with a gag in her mouth and blindfold over her eyes. I looked in the bathroom and I saw her in the bathtub, and then I knew she was dead. I knew she was. I didn't go in. I, I just. I just told the manager to go down and call the police. I just knew. The last known contact with Leisha was two days earlier. The body had been there for hours, and much of the evidence had either been washed away or damaged by the water in the tub. The medical examiner didn't find any evidence of a sexual assault. There was no biological or seminal fluid that was found. The closest thing to a witness was the apartment manager, and he wasn't much help. He indicated that he might have seen somebody outside in the area, but didn't give any information to the police that would have been helpful. Detectives were perplexed by the crime scene. Drawers had been rifled. A blanket had been draped out of Leisha's bedroom and was tied to the fire escape, a possible escape route. But there was no sign of forced entry. If Leisha's killer got in by the front door, he could have left the same way. The scene was confusing. The clothes were shredded, the knife, the ropes, the pantyhose, all that stuff. It, it was a chaotic scene. Leisha had no significant defensive wounds. A knife from a matching set that came from inside the apartment was found near the body. In fact, all the implements of this crime came from inside. The suspect came unprepared. He used everything in her apartment once he got there. Police soon concluded nothing had been stolen. The scene had been staged to look like a robbery. Even stranger, Leisha's stereo, which had been stolen just a month before her murder, was back in her apartment, something detectives were unable to explain it was kind of up in the air as to how that stereo ultimately ended up back in her bedroom. It looked like someone other than Leisha apparently had free access to her apartment. The question was who? The lack of forced entry into Leisha Schollmeyer's apartment and her being blindfolded led detectives to an early conclusion. It just suggests that she knew exactly who her killer was, and he knew that she knew him. Leisha was outgoing and had plenty of male friends, both at work and at school. As detectives prepared to contact these young men, they were stopped cold by one in particular. His name was Lonnie Passy. He lived in the apartment directly below Leisha's and he'd recently finished a six-year stint in jail for his involvement in a fatal bar fight. Lonnie Passy was a person that Leisha met at jail. She went with a friend of hers to the jail because her friend's boyfriend was in jail, and they became pen pals, and she would write to him. And so when Lonnie got out of jail, he moved into the same apartment complex that Leisha was living in. And he expressed a clear romantic interest in Leisha. He was a con. He had been in jail. And so he came out thinking that he was going to hook up with her, and she was not interested. She said, I like your car, but I don't like you. And that's kind of how my sister was. She didn't like pussyfoot over everybody's feelings, you know? This hardly tied Lonnie to Leisha's murder, but something else appeared to. He had scratches across his upper body. He had indicated to police that he had received those scratch marks a week or two before. But that's not what the medical examiner said. She told police that Lonnie's scratches were just a few days old. 
This would have been around the time of Leisha's murder, and Lonnie's alibi for these scratches, in fact, all of his alibis, eventually collapsed. The night of the, the homicide, Lonnie claims he was with his girlfriend Kathy at the time, so that was his alibi. Later, she states she was not with Lonnie, nor did she ever give him those scratches. And since Leisha knew Lonnie, she would most likely have let him into her apartment. Even stranger was the mystery stereo, the one that had been stolen and then suddenly reappeared in Leisha's apartment after her murder. The stereo had previously been seen in Lonnie Passy's apartment, and so for it to end up back in her apartment is a lot of suspicion as to how that stereo got there. Everything pointed to Lonnie. The problem was that detectives couldn't prove anything. Even worse, DNA in crime science didn't even exist. This was 1977, a full 10 years before the world's first ever DNA conviction. Leisha's rape kit came up empty, even for blood type. Back in the 70s, there was no crime lab that had any specialization on sex assault kits that could determine if there was a sperm present or anything like that. There was no hard evidence against Lonnie or anyone else. Years and then decades slipped by. Leisha's case got colder and colder. So all leads had gone, and there was nothing else that they could do. And unfortunately, the case, like many others, went to the bottom of a heap, to a pile of unsolved crimes. It gets to the point where you, you don't even tell people it happened because it's, a, it's an o- open hole in your life. But detectives and Leisha's family never fully gave up hope. Her mother went over every possibility and kept in contact with detectives. A lot of people, when I watch your show, I hear them say how they can't go on. And you know, that's the one thing you've got to do. You've got to go on. And I had four children at home that needed me to go on. And I did it for them. My mom was watching forensic files and she was watching all these things. And every time a case was solved that was that many years old, She'd be like, well, then Leisha's could be solved. I didn't know she was doing that because I would have probably told her to stop it, you know, because I didn't believe in it. But as time passed, they started to believe and forensic science ultimately justified their faith. At the dawn of the 21st century, DNA technology was revolutionizing how police investigated crimes. Many cases that had gone stone cold were reopened, including Leisha Schollmeyer's. When you have DNA, it's not just the evidence from before. Now we can open up new doors, take that very same evidence, and find DNA out of a cloth that was tied up for a gag to be put in her mouth. Detective Hillary Gordon was one of the investigators assigned to Leisha's case when it was reopened in 2016. I thought it was a very solvable case, and I just found it fascinating. Every time I had a free moment, I would work on this case and read through every transcript, every interview, every detail. As Detective Gordon re-examined the case file, she noticed something detectives back in the 70s would not have focused on. I noticed that the photographs of the victim in her bathtub showed her face down. And the knots from the blindfold and the gag were at the back of her head and were not submerged in water. Large amounts of skin cells would be sloughed off while tying the knots on those pieces of clothing, a potentially rich source of DNA. That is, if those items were still in evidence and if they hadn't been contaminated by investigators not familiar with DNA. Did they use gloves to move her out of the bathtub? Who touched her, moving her from the scene to the medical examiner's office that could have left DNA? And one photograph I was able to collect from the medical examiner's office of the autopsy showed them wearing gloves, and I was so thrilled. 
Amazingly, nearly 40 years after the crime, the gag and blindfold from the scene were still in evidence storage, and in a key break, the knots had not been untied. When I pulled it out of the bag, it was still tied in the exact same way that it had been when it was on her body. The gag and the blindfold were still completely intact. In 2013, traditional swabbing generated Leisha's DNA and also some DNA from an unidentified male. They tried conventional swabbing and we did find YSDR DNA and YSDR DNA focuses in on the male chromosome, the Y chromosome, but it just wasn't enough to develop a full SDR profile. And that full profile was needed to provide a conclusive identification. So with new forensic technology coming online every year, investigators waited for tech to catch up to their case. And in 2016, it looked like it might have, in the form of a new forensic tool called MVAC. MVAC gives investigators opportunities to collect DNA where they couldn't get it before, especially the rough and poor surfaces like rocks, bricks, even some clothing items where traditional methods like swabbing and scraping and cuttings won't necessarily collect the amount of DNA that's needed to produce a good profile. MVAC has been known to gather 39 times more DNA than traditional swabbing. But would it work on a couple of flimsy pieces of cloth that had been sitting in storage for almost 40 years? If so, the knots tied in those pieces of cloth would be key. We're going to target those because we feel like those have been manipulated the most, knotting up and interacting with the suspect's hands. MVAC essentially bathes the test item in a neutral solution. This loosens up the DNA, which is then vacuumed up for analysis. The solution is extracted, leaving the DNA behind. Next step is something called amplification. DNA amplification is the DNA photocopier forensics taking small amounts of DNA and making it into massive amounts of DNA. The result, in addition to Leisha's DNA, was a full male profile, almost certainly the killer's. We come back and say, ah, it worked. It worked. Those kind of wow moments, those light bulb moments are amazing. And they're so few and far between that when they happen, you just have to relish it and you just have to, you have to celebrate. Now investigators turned to their top suspect. Lonnie Passy had been on their radar since Leisha's murder, and they were convinced this DNA profile would tie him to the crime. But DNA doesn't lie. I was absolutely shocked, but now it makes so much sense. In the four decades since Leisha Schollmeyer's murder, detectives and her family kept a close watch on Lonnie Passy, the chief suspect. In 2016, they were convinced their new DNA profile would prove Lonnie was Leisha's killer and were stunned to find they were mistaken. I was absolutely shocked that it did not match Lonnie Passy because we thought he was absolutely the guy for this homicide. Lonnie had nothing to do with it. I don't know where when he got the scratches, that's that's the million dollar question, I suppose. But Lonnie didn't have anything to do with this homicide. But investigators were not back to square one. They entered the MVAC generated genetic profile into CODIS, the national DNA database, and were stunned yet again. And I couldn't believe it. I was so excited. I stood up in the office and I started jumping up and down and I was yelling, oh my God, we, we solved this case. We've solved this case. The DNA profile matched Patrick McCabe, the apartment manager who led Leisha's mom to her body way back in 1977. I was aghast that he actually had the nerve to walk into that apartment with me, knowing I was going to find the woman he had killed. And he stood right there and actually called the police for me. I mean, what kind of a sick person is like that, you know? I have no idea. No idea. How could you do that to another human being? 
how could you do that to the mom that you would allow that to happen to her to see her own daughter killed in such a violent fashion it's cold McCabe 20 years old at the time of Leisha's murder knew she lived alone and he had the keys to all the apartments in the complex back in 1977 Police were so convinced Lonnie Passy was the killer that McCabe slipped away. McCabe ultimately wound up in Florida. His DNA entered the database because of another sexually motivated crime. In 1998, he had sexually assaulted a 14-year-old and had been convicted of that crime and sent to prison for a year for that crime. Forty long years after Leisha's murder, McCabe was finally confronted with the evidence. He soon realized science had caught up with him and confessed. I went up to her apartment. It was dark. I raped her. I'm scared. And she was sexual arousal was released. I guess it's out of the all games. What am I going to do now? And McCabe took a plea deal and was sentenced to 10 years to life. We could never give him what he deserves. We'd have to be like him to do it. He got 40 years of freedom. I, no, he didn't get what he deserves. Investigators believe McCabe long planned to rape Leisha. On the night of the murder, he used his key entered the apartment, grabbed a knife from the kitchen, and attacked her while she slept. She could do nothing as he tied her up and gagged her before the assault. Then, knowing she could identify him, he convinced himself he had no choice but to kill her. He strangled her and submerged her in the tub, hoping the evidence would wash away, which it did until the MVAC conclusively tied him to a crime he'd gotten away with for 40 long years. Cops are only human, and and that they're only given what evidence they can find in that. But a machine that can go so much further into the molecules, and the, it gives the police so much weaponry to fight with. In the process of inventing the MVAC, my dad always had the understanding that the reason that he was given the resources to develop the MVAC was to make a difference. It was to help somebody that couldn't be helped otherwise. The MVAC was superb. It did exactly what we wanted it to do. It gave Leisha justice. It gave her family closure. It put a very horrible person in prison. It ultimately just did what all of us couldn't do for 40 years. Someone selfish needs. Family member. And as a result, I treated her more like a little sister, I think, than than a daughter for a while. Lisa, mom. And she was my everything. Um, I was secure in this world with her. The restaurant where she was working were concerned and called her mother. So she contacted the... Up, ...face down with a gag in her mouth and blindfold over her eyes. I looked in the... ...was who? Conclusion. It just suggests that she knew exactly who her killer was, and he knew that she knew him. Leisha was outgoing. Khan, he had been in jail. 
And so he came out thinking that he was going to hook up with her and she I like your car, but I don't like you. And that's kind of how my sister was. She didn't like pussyfoot over everybody's feelings, you know. Had indicated to police that he had received those scratch marks a week or two before. Eventually collapsed. The night of the, the homicide, Lonnie claims he was with his girlfriend, Kathy, at the time. So that was his. They justified their faith. When you have DNA, it's not just the evidence from before. Now we can open up new doors, take that very same evidence and find DNA. I had a free and I would work on this case and read through every transcript, every interview, every detail. As Detective Gordon identified male. They tried conventional swabbing and we did find YST. MVAC gives investigators opportunities to collect DNA where they couldn't get it before, especially the rough and poor surfaces. Pieces of cloth would be key. We're going to target those because we feel like those have been manipulated the most. Nodding up and interacting with... Doesn't lie. I was absolutely shocked, but now it makes so much sense. mistaken. I was absolutely shocked that it did not match Lonnie Passy because we thought he was absolutely the guy for this homicide. Lonnie had nothing to do with it. I don't know where Lonnie got the scratches. That's that's the million dollar question, I suppose. But Lonnie didn't have anything to do with this homicide. But investigators... I was aghast that he actually had the nerve to walk into that apartment with me, knowing I was going to find the woman you do that to the mom, that you would allow that to happen to her, to see her own daughter. Long years after Leisha's murder, McCabe was finally confronted with the evidence. He soon realized science had caught up with him and confessed. I love you, Marvin. I was dark. I raped her. That sexual arousal was released. I guess they're all being static. What am I going to do now? And that's when I started back. McCabe took a plea deal and was sentenced to 10 years to life. We could never give him what he deserves. We'd have to be like him to do it. He got 40 years of freedom. The understanding that the reason that he was given the resources to develop the MVAC was to make a difference. It was to help somebody. What we wanted it to do. It gave Alicia justice. It gave her family closure. It put a very horrible person in prison. It ultimately just did what all of us couldn't do for 40 years. Up next, a desperate woman struggles to survive. She was trying to get to the phone. Hard to say if that was before or after she was shot. Police have a solid suspect, but he's got an airtight alibi. This is not your prototypical killer. We were looking everywhere to try to get to the bottom of this mystery. The killer knows how to destroy evidence and nearly succeeds. I've had a number of cases where individuals have tried to obliterate the microscopic marks produced by the barrel. Luckily for forensic scientists, some of these folks don't know what they're doing. Southern Pennsylvania is dotted with numerous small towns and communities centered around farming and agriculture. York County, Pennsylvania is right along the border with Maryland. 
with a history that goes back prior to the Civil War. It has uh, some involvement in the Battle of Gettysburg. Violent crime is a rarity in the area. So when, on a March afternoon in 2010, a 911 operator got a call with no response on the other end, it was assumed to be an accidental call. York County 911, dispatcher 65. Hello? Hello? 99% of those turn out to be totally nothing, either a kid playing with a phone or, or something along those lines. It's nothing that would raise an alarm. The York County Control hung up the phone and called back and received a busy signal, so that means that the line is still open. The call was from a landline, from the home of a 55-year-old woman named Monica Schmeyer. An officer responded to the house, located in a very remote area. Monica's house is located on the top of a hill. You can only get there through the kind of a winding driveway that gets to the home. Police arrived, announced their presence, but got no response. The reason became clear shortly after they entered the residence. So I was the second one on scene. She was on the floor in the living room, and uh, she was obviously deceased. We suspected a gunshot wound to the head, but we weren't 100% sure exactly what was going on. The victim was identified as Monica Schmeyer. On the floor next to her body was a single 32 caliber shell casing. The brand, Spear, was plainly visible. At first, there was no sign of a struggle in the house. If anything jumped out at the beginning, it was possibly more of a suicidal situation, that it was a possibility that she had killed herself. That was the initial thought. But a quick survey of the scene put that theory to rest. There was no gun in the house. Monica's face was bloody and bruised, indicating she'd been struck in the head. A blood trail across the floor led to her body. She had blood on the inside of her thighs that were in, in a pattern consistent with dripping downward into her inner thighs, as well as blood on the soles of her feet and her socks. So at some point in time, she had gotten up from where she had been sitting and bleeding and moved across the floor towards the phone where she was ultimately killed. In fact, it appeared Monica's last act was to call 911. This provided a vital clue. The 911 call becomes so important because they can pinpoint exactly when the call was made. 2.52. How does that help them? Well, it helps them narrow down the time of death. Police were puzzled. No motive for this murder was immediately apparent. Her purse was found inside the house. There was lots of other personal property. There was cameras and phones and TVs and VCRs. Even stranger? There were a lot of white envelopes all over the room, and they were filled with cash. Monica had an interesting way of handling cash and paying her bills. She, she didn't trust banks, so she kept cash in her home whenever she needed it. If the killer left thousands of dollars behind, murder would seem to be the only motive. But who would want Monica Schmeyer dead? It didn't take long to find a suspect. Experience shows that, you know, somebody's going to kill you, they usually know you, and it's usually someone very close to you. Monica Schmeyer met her husband, John, at medical school in the late 1970s. When they married, she gave up her medical career to be a stay-at-home mom for the couple's two daughters. John Schmeyer built a successful ophthalmology practice. Life, at least for a while, was good. According to Monica, John seemed to develop uh, a wandering eye. And when she found out about it, being a Catholic as she was, she, she didn't want to get a divorce. So she actually stayed with John for a number of years. Monica eventually consented to a divorce, at least on paper. In Monica's mind, regardless of what the divorce papers said, they were married and they were until death do they part. When detectives notified John Schmeyer of his ex-wife's execution-style murder, 
His reaction struck them as more than a little unusual. It looked more like an act than a natural reaction. He would cry and then look up and cry and look up and there were no tears. He would go from crying to talking, back to crying, back to talking, but there was never a tear. Smyer readily admitted he and Monica had issues. He said he wanted to move on from the marriage, but Monica insisted on being part of his life. He was very frustrated with the divorce, how things were going. Um, it had been drawn out. It had been a couple years since they had split. And Schmeyer was known to complain about this. Friends said that what he found particularly galling was not how much he paid in alimony, but how Monica insisted it be paid. She didn't trust banks. So John would pay Monica in cash every month. She would set that money aside, apportioning it for her bills. Then she would go back to John, give him that cash back, and he would write the checks to the utilities or others that she owed money to. Try as he might, Schmeyer couldn't free himself from his now ex-wife, but he insisted he had nothing to do with her murder. Police knew practically to the minute when that murder happened, and Schmeyer said he had an alibi. He was at a local restaurant with a group of friends who called themselves the Orange Shorts Society. The Orange Shorts Society, which is a group of middle-aged men that get together once a week at the at a local restaurant, and they would, you know, talk about politics, money, investments, whatever, but uh, they were all well-to-do men. On the afternoon of Monica's murder, most of the usual group met, and they confirmed John Schmeyer was there. At first blush, it did seem that he had an alibi, but you could still be a hire for murder type situation. There seemed to be enough bad blood there. It would appear that he could gain substantially from her death. So now investigators turned to what little evidence they had. An autopsy revealed Monica died from a close range gunshot to the head. A 32 caliber bullet consistent with the casing found at the scene was recovered and forensically examined. The general rifling characteristics list that was populated showed that firearms produced by Colt, Dixon, and Keltec were among the firearms that could have fired this particular specimen. While the bullet was damaged, it had sufficient markings to match it to the murder weapon if only that gun could be found. If you submit a gun or you submit a barrel, then we can go and test fire those and uh, compare them to this particular weapon. There were possible witnesses to the murder. Even though Monica's house was well off the road, a neighbor saw a man walking in the direction of her house shortly before she made the 911 call. About 20 minutes later, the man appeared again, walking away from Monica's house. He sees that same man walking in, in what he described as walking with a purpose, carrying what he believed to be a white envelope in his hand, which then, you know, we immediately say, oh, white envelope, white envelope. We had white envelopes at the scene with cash. The man was described as a white male, approximately five feet nine with a medium build. A second witness said he also saw a man matching that same description walking up a hill away from Monica's house and that he drove away in a silver van. Not a, you know, soccer mom van, not a big box truck, but like a work van, a work type van parked facing down the hill. So far, these witness descriptions were all detectives had to identify this man. It couldn't be said for certain if he even had anything to do with Monica's murder or if he had any ties to Monica's ex-husband. We'll come up with 15 different ways this thing happened. We gotta find the right one and prove that one. That's, that's sort of the name of the game. The prime suspect in the murder of Monica Schmeyer was a man seen near her home on the day of the murder. Detectives focused on the vehicle the man was driving, a silver full-sized van. The witness who saw the van didn't get a license plate and didn't know the make of the vehicle. There was no specific markings about it. We found about 50 different silver vans. We had vans. We don't know if we had the van. 
Businesses in nearby towns were canvassed. Detectives hoped either man or machine had seen the van. Everybody has cameras, everybody's, you know, banks and, and stores and ATMs. And I mean, there's cameras everywhere nowadays. So it's a cursory thing for us. We'll, we'll check all the video. A bank in a town about three miles from Monica's house captured video of a full-sized silver van heading in the direction of her house about 15 minutes before the murder. You see that same van twice on the video, once prior to the time of death and once after the time of death, corresponding the direction of travel as far as to and from the house. But the video was blurry and attempts to enhance it were unsuccessful. There was no way to, to try to get a license plate or anything along those lines because the camera itself is designed and focused on people entering and exiting the bank, not in the background. Which put the investigation almost back to square one. Since Monica didn't date, there were no ex or current boyfriends in the picture, and the possibility of this being a random murder was dismissed out of hand. You just didn't find this house on a whim? This was a house that you had to know was there? We knew we had to find a connection to Monica. We just didn't know what that connection was yet. Searching for anything he could have missed, Detective Doug Demingon reviewed his notes and found something interesting from his initial interviews with friends of Monica's ex-husband, the members of the Orange Short Society. On the afternoon of the murder, the group was joined by a young woman named Sarah, who was engaged to be married to one of the members. I'm going through my notebook and I'm getting to my interview with Sarah and I'm looking and I'm flipping and I see the name Tim Jacoby at the top of this piece of paper. Tim Jacoby was the only regular member of the Orange Short Society who wasn't present that day. And I went, oh my gosh. I said, you know, I never really looked into this guy and I then pull his driver's license photo up and again, oh my gosh. His height fits, his description fits, everything fits. Jacoby was 37 years old, had a good job as an engineer, and didn't appear, at first, to be a cold-blooded killer. And then as you dug a little deeper, oddly enough, you found that he had this armed robbery history. I find that he has a prior robbery arrest where he involved a, a takeover of a jewelry store where he ended up dropping the jewelry as he was fleeing. Jacoby pleaded no contest and, with no prior criminal history, escaped jail time. Records showed he owned a 32 caliber Caltech semi-automatic pistol. The bells are going off now because a 32 caliber is what they're looking for. That is the shell casing they found at the scene of the crime. While Jacoby didn't know Monica, detectives say they had never met, he did know of her through John Schmeyer and the Orange Short Society. I take it to all of our investigators and I say, here we go, Tim knows John. So now is this a whole conspiracy that John pays Tim to knock off Monica? So now we're back in full throttle and we're moving ahead. After weeks of frustration, detectives finally had a possible suspect in the murder of Monica Schmeyer. Tim Jacoby fit witness descriptions. He knew where Monica lived, and employment records showed he was driving a company van, a full-sized silver van, just like a witness saw on the day of the murder. It's the same make, same model, same year, same color, everything. Circumstantially, when you look at it, it's the same van as the one we saw in the video going towards Monica's house at 2.38 and coming back through at 2.59. A search warrant was executed on Jacoby's home. His live-in fiance, Sarah, didn't take it well. She literally threw up. When I was talking to her, she got so worked up, she was hyperventilating and she vomited in a garbage can. Detectives didn't find a 32 caliber gun, but they did find a 32 caliber Caltech gun barrel. The rest of the gun was nowhere to be found. But the gun barrel would be consistent with the murder weapon. There was one problem. 
Someone had scoured the inside of the barrel, an apparent attempt to destroy it as a piece of evidence. These particular marks were probably produced by a uh, hard surface tool that was used to scratch or to actually mark the lands and grooves inside the, the barrel. Test bullets were fired through the damaged barrel, but the scratches apparently worked. They prevented a definitive match from being made to the bullet recovered from Monica's autopsy. The bullets lacked sufficient microscopic marks to render an opinion of an identification. Detectives now learned that Jacoby often used his parents' nearby farm for target practice. Teams of forensic analysts descended on the property. We found the box to the Caltech gun. We found the receipt for the Caltech gun. We found ammunition for the, the Caltech 32. But still no gun. However, in the area where Jacoby did his target practice, investigators found four spent shell casings from a 32 caliber. It was hard to say how long these casings had been there. Once those particular cartridge cases were cleaned up, the examiner was able to see that these were manufactured by Spear. They were 32 auto caliber. Uh, it's the same as the cartridge case that was recovered at the scene of the crime. In the same way that bullets are made distinctive by the gun that fires them, shell casings also retain tool marks that are unique to a particular weapon. Microscopic markings on the base of the casings were compared under a microscope to the casing recovered from Monica's living room, and they matched. The opinion that was rendered was that, in fact, all of these cartridge cases were fired from the same firearm. That definitively tied Tim Jacoby, or at least shell casings on his parents' property, to the fatal bullet. He was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. But one question remained. Why would he kill someone he didn't even know? On face value, Tim would not have had any reason to kill Monica, unless hired by John to do so. Investigators did a deep dive into John Schmeier's financial records, looking for any kind of payment to Jacoby. There was nothing there. We were unable to substantiate any kind of connection between John, Sarah, and Tim, and then it got to the point where, okay, we've now eliminated John. Investigators believe Tim Jacoby targeted Monica not for murder, but robbery. He knew there were thousands of dollars of cash laying around her house. After all, his friend John Schmeier complained about it all the time. I think he listened to the stories. I think he knew about the money. I think he knew about the envelopes. Investigators believe Jacoby drove to the house that day in his silver work van. He parked up the street, entered the house, and pointed the gun at Monica while he tried to scoop up envelopes containing money. But Monica fought back, or tried to run away. Jacoby hit her in the face, knocking her to the ground. As he looked for more envelopes, it appears Monica crawled to the phone and called 911. Jacoby rushed over and shot her in the head. He took several envelopes filled with cash and walked back to the van, where he was seen by Monica's neighbors. He got rid of the gun, but the shell casings left earlier at his makeshift target range matched the single bullet casing to Monica's body. In October of 2014, Tim Jacoby was convicted of charges including first-degree murder and sentenced to death, largely because of microscopic tool marks on shell casings he apparently didn't even know were there. Jacoby remains on death row. This case was definitely a whodunit. And in my 28 years of law enforcement, we didn't really get a whole lot of good whodunits. It took a lot of time and energy to get to the bottom. This this was a challenge for our, our little police department. And luckily and, and happily, it, it turned out good. When we started, we had a, you know, a thousand piece puzzle and we didn't have the edges done. So, you know, the forensic evidence gave us the edges in the middle, and we were able to put all that whole picture together so that when the jury looked at those puzzle pieces, they didn't see puzzle pieces. They saw the picture on the box.
Up next, her murder stuns even hardened New Yorkers. It was a pretty horrific homicide, and we knew that the suspect perpetrator was still on the loose. We begin tonight with the latest developments in a crime that has shocked this unshockable city. The life cut short, way too short. That should have never happened. The killer has attempted to strip all identification from his victim. We didn't know the cause of death at that point. We didn't know who she was. I can't find out who killed you unless I know who you are. Detectives finally ID the dead woman and are led to a killer with a seemingly limitless capacity for violence. It's just beyond belief. It's like a Jack the Ripper kind of guy. You know, just absolute animals. Away from the glare of the lights and gleaming skyscrapers of New York City are some little traveled byways, notorious to locals and to police, for being dirty, desolate, and dangerous. Saturday, February 25th, 2006, a body turned up in one of those places, about 20 miles from downtown Manhattan. Well, yes, I found a DOA. It looks like a DOA on Seaview Avenue in Fountain. Oh, that's in Brooklyn, right? Oh, yes. And I've seen him wrapped up in a heap. All right. It was a male. Do you see? I don't see. I didn't see. It was a body. It looked like a body wrapped in a heap, yes. All right. You want to leave a name and number, sir? Uh, no, I write it with name and number. I don't want to get involved. All right, sure. First responders came upon a horrific scene. The victim was a young female, probably in her 20s. This victim was naked and wrapped in a blanket and would, bat, would uh, twist ties behind the back with... It basically used its handcuffs. The victim's head was wrapped with packing tape. Some sort of cloth had been shoved down her throat. A chunk of her hair had been cut away. One of a number of apparent attempts by her killer to cover up his crime. Knew enough on how to clean up the scene. He cut her fingernails down, so there was no DNA underneath, of her, underneath her nails. There were no surveillance cameras in the area. There was no identification on the victim, but her body still gave investigators some basic information. What stood out to me is uh, she had specific tan lines on her and she was Latino. So middle of February in the cold, she either came, just came from somewhere warm or was not from the area originally. A snow brush was found near the body. No one was sure if this had anything to do with the murder. 48 hours after the body was found, a woman called police to say her friend, Emmet St. Guillen, had gone missing. And one thing she said was that Emmet had just returned from Florida uh, the night before, you know, the day before she went missing. And that immediately struck a chord with the detective because there was a tan. Tonight, the sad irony, New York's top detectives are furiously investigating her murder as they search for a killer on the loose. 24-year-old Emmet St. Guillen, a Boston native, was two months away from a graduate degree in criminal justice. She was fabulous, fabulous young woman. It's a tremendous loss. In this case, when a child dies, you die. There's a part of you that will never, ever be resurrected again. Emmet's autopsy made it clear her murder was even more gruesome than first responders originally thought. There was definitely damage to her um, private areas, uh, indicating it would seem as though there was a forcible sex crime of some sort going on. I believe it was a sock that was in her mouth actually pushed her tongue in backwards. That was the cause of death. So we're not looking for a weapon. We're not looking for ballistic evidence in this type of case. Incredibly, no foreign DNA was found on the body. Assaulting his victim and then removing all his DNA from her body would have taken hours, which meant Emmet's killer had to have a safe place to do all this. And that location wasn't where her body was found. It was so time consuming with the, the zip ties and the wrapping and the cord and the blanket and the tape. It'd be too much time for the person to do it there. 
If this case was going to be solved, detectives needed to find out not only who did the murder, but also where he did it. Investigators were stunned to find that Emet Sankin's killer was able to remove all foreign DNA from her body. But he couldn't remove everything. The tape and blanket used to wrap her body were rich sources of trace evidence. Analyst Nick Petraco found red carpet fibers on both. Cheap colored nylon fiber, uh, of carpet fibers. And I happen to know what those red rug fibers look like on that particular carpet because I've seen that kind of carpet many times in casework. Petraco's microscopic search also revealed animal hairs. I'm finding mink hair, so there's a mink coat around there somewhere. Rabbit hairs of the type used in coats were also found. A tiny drop of blood was found on one of the plastic ties used as handcuffs. And some DNA was recovered from the snow brush found near the victim's body. The sample that came off of the snow brush was touch DNA. And so that is basically DNA that is deposited when someone handles an item. Analysts paid particular attention to the blanket that wrapped the body, hitting it with ultraviolet light in an attempt to expose possible bodily fluids. And in a major potential break, what turned out to be a semen stain luminesced when hit with the light. The semen profile was very degraded, so we knew right away that the semen profile was likely to be pretty old. Detectives now turned to Annette's final night. It was a Friday, just days away from her 25th birthday, and she was celebrating with friends, including her best friend, Claire. And it was getting late in the night. It was almost like 4 o'clock in the morning. They had been on vacation. Claire was ready to go home. Come on, Annette, let's go. Annette wasn't ready to go. Claire's trying to almost pull her in the cab and convince her to go home. Emmett doesn't want any part of it, and she starts to walk down the block. Police hoped surveillance cameras would give them some idea of where Emmett went. These days, they're on practically every street corner and every shop. Not so in 2006. And so they got no video of any help in determining where she went. But by tracing Emmett's credit card activity... Detectives found she paid for two drinks at a bar called The Falls. The receipt was uh, recorded within 15 minutes of 4 a.m., just before bars in New York City required to close. This would be 17 hours from when her body was found. Detectives needed to find out what happened during this window and face some daunting problems. There were multiple crime scenes. At some point, Emmett's killer needed to subdue her and no one knew where that happened. He took his time to assault her, kill her, and remove his DNA from her body. Where that happened, no one knew. And he most likely needed a vehicle to get to and from all these spots, and no one knew where that vehicle was. There was really very little evidence to point in any direction. The investigation is really just the body at that point. You don't have any items or location that you can focus on or use in investigating that crime. Detectives hoped people at a Met's last known location, the Falls Bar, could provide some answers, but got yet another setback. First of all, do they have any video? They don't have any video inside. But the bartender at the Falls remembered a Met. She told detectives closing time was four o'clock and a Met wasn't ready to go. And she didn't want to leave because she still paid for her drinks. This bartender said her boss, bar manager Danny Dorian, saw what was happening and told the bartender to get a bouncer to escort Emmett from the bar. But Danny Dorian denied that ever happened. Danny Dorian was not very forthcoming initially. He claimed not to have any recollection of her. And I remember the detectives coming back and they're like, yeah, we went there, we spoke to this guy, Danny Dorian, and we think he's holding back on something. And I just remember thinking, wait a minute, Dorian? I, I know that name. Why do I know that name? It turned out that in New York City, a lot of people knew the Dorian name. Dorian is a famous name in New York City. 
There's the eerie connection between that falls and another infamous New York watering hole, the one where preppy killer Robert Chambers met his victim. In 1986, 20-year-old Robert Chambers was arrested for the murder of his girlfriend, 18-year-old Jennifer Levin. It became infamous as the preppy murder case. It was the highest profile case in New York, probably in that entire decade. And everyone knew the name Dorian. Why? Because the last place Jennifer Levin was seen alive was at a bar owned by Denny Dorian's family. Was there a possible connection with this latest high-profile murder? No one knew. But one thing not in question was that Danny Dorian, bar manager of the last place in Met Sanguian was seen alive, was telling police a story they did not believe. In the 1980s, a New York family, the Dorians, got caught up in the infamous preppy murder case. They owned the bar where the victim spent her final night. Now, in 2006, there was a possible connection to yet another gruesome murder. The Dorian family's bar, The Falls, was the last place murder victim Emmet St. Guillen was seen alive. And bar manager Danny Dorian told police he'd never laid eyes on her. That wasn't what police heard from people working the bar. And that was a big problem for Danny Dorian. We get a phone call to report to police headquarters right away to the chief of detective's office. Now, the, it's very strange to get a phone call like that, especially in the middle of a case. So we get there and it turns out it was Danny Dorian, his attorney. Turns out he didn't know that she was there. He doesn't know how she died, but he's now able to put her there in the bar. Danny Dorian's problem wasn't any connection to the murder. He was alibied. His problem was his bouncer, Daryl Littlejohn. Danny Dorian was not a good bar manager, and the evidence that he was not a good bar manager is who he hired to be his bouncer, or one of his bouncers, which was Daryl Littlejohn, and he did so without any attempt to uh, check his references and see how legitimate or not he was. 41-year-old Little John was a convicted felon. He'd served more than eight years for robbery and drug offenses. So he violated his parole. He should not have been working in a, any place that sells liquor, and he should not have been working at 4 o'clock in the morning while he's on parole. Little John told police that on a Mets last night, he did what his boss, Danny Dorian, told him to do. He got her out of the bar. This made him the last known person to see her alive. Now, that caused the police to obviously take an interest in him. Because Little John violated his parole, detectives had no problem getting a search warrant. The trail left by his cell phone on the morning of the murder put him at his house and, ominously, near where Emmett's body was dumped. Does that mean he had killed her? No. But it means now he's at the crime scene where we found the Met. So now, everything is now focusing on Little John. Police here in New York now say they've got compelling evidence connecting a barroom bouncer to the murder of this promising young woman who spent her final hours at his bar. Trace evidence teams descended on the home Little John shared with his mother and also his van, searching for anything that could be tied back to a Met's body. One of the first things that the crime scene investigators noticed was about a dozen empty bleach bottles in the garbage outside the house. What do you use a dozen empty bottles of bleach for? Well, if you know how to destroy DNA evidence, you know bleach does it. Every inch of the house and van was searched. Incredibly, just as with the Met's body, no foreign DNA was found. Absolutely no DNA don't find any evidence that shows that she was there at all. If Daryl Littlejohn was a Mets killer, he'd done an unusually thorough job of cleaning multiple crime scenes. But a forensic dogma called the Locard Exchange Principle, it dates back more than 100 years to the very beginning of crime scene investigation, holds that it's impossible to completely clean crime scene. 
if you go back to your guy named Edmund Lacard, a doctor from France, his principle states that there's always materials to be found. Someone always leaves something. Ultimately, what it's saying is you don't find it means you. it's your fault. It's there. And sure enough, tiny clues remained that finally told the story of what happened to Emmet St. Guillen. Among the key pieces of trace evidence recovered from Emmet St. Guillen's crime scene were red carpet fibers and animal hairs from a mink and a rabbit. You're trying to use these bits of evidence to help you figure out where it happened. Once Daryl Littlejohn emerged as a suspect, crime scene techs were on the lookout for these hairs and fibers. That's the beauty of this stuff, and it helps you reconstruct the whole event. It's really powerful. One red carpet fiber by itself would mean a lot. Well, you get two, three different materials that are all associating one place means a lot more mathematically as far as probability it happened there. When Daryl Littlejohn's house and minivan were searched, a red carpet was found inside the house, and fibers from it were microscopically consistent with fibers from the dump site. Littlejohn's mother, who lived with him, owned a mink coat, and those hairs were also consistent as were hairs from a coat of hers with a rabbit fur collar. And there were also shoes he had. On the bottom of the shoes, there were red carpet fibers attached to it. That's probably how they got into the van. Mother probably wore the mink coat to go to church on Sunday, and she leaves a couple of hairs from the mink coat on the seat. This evidence definitively tied Daryl Littlejohn to a Met's body. But there was a problem. So far, Prosecutors could only prove that he'd gotten rid of Emmett's corpse, not that he'd committed her murder. It created, or it left some degree of doubt as to whether he was actually the killer. And Daryl Littlejohn, who had a very good lawyer, said he was no killer. I'm truly, I'm truly sorry what happened to this young lady, but they have the wrong person. Forensic analysts now turned to the degraded semen stain on the blanket used to cover in that body. The DNA results delivered a bombshell. And I took another look at the semen sample and thought it looks similar to Daryl Littlejohn's DNA, similar enough that it could be a relative. Now, as it turns out, Daryl had a brother who did die while in custody in the Queen's House of Detention, awaiting trial on a double murder. He died of some sort of asthma attack. This happened 11 years earlier, which would account for why the sample was so degraded. They, they've also tested, I understand, the blanket in which Emet's body was wrapped. What have you learned about those tests? There was semen on the blanket, but unfortunately, the semen on the blanket was somebody else's. But in the end, just as a famous French criminalist stated nearly a century earlier, you can't completely clean a crime scene. The touch DNA from the snow brush near Emmett's body matched Little John, but it was the trace evidence, what analysts call innocent transfer, that linked Little John to Emmett's body. All of this was confirmed when his DNA was lifted from a small blood stain on one of the zip ties. It remained, despite what even analysts admit, was an incredible job of attempting to clean the scene. He might be thinking about blood and semen and spittle and that kind of thing, or was even his hairs. But he's not thinking about the stuff that's around him all the time, the red carpet, the mink coat. That, he's not thinking about that stuff. And that's the stuff that ultimately helps to nail him. Investigators believe that when Little John was told to get him met out of the bar, he'd found an easy mark. She'd had a lot to drink. The streets were nearly empty. Once outside, he subdued her and got her into his van. Where he took her next is the subject of speculation. What's clear is that he spent hours assaulting her, then bleaching her body and the scene. But he was unaware of the fibers and animal hairs that had simply become part of his environment, all of which stuck to his victim. It appears that at some point in this assault, Emmet might have fought back. It's possible she injured Little John and his DNA got on her hair. That could be the reason he cut part of her hair away. He also cut her nails in another attempt to eliminate DNA. Now, 
the murder done and the cleanup apparently complete, he had to get rid of the body. Soon he was outside, exposed, and in a hurry to get away. The snow brush from inside his van with his DNA got tangled up with the body as he dumped it. But a small blood stain on the zip tie left absolutely no doubt he was the killer. In June of 2009, Daryl Littlejohn was found guilty of first-degree murder and was sentenced to life without parole, all on the strength of evidence he tried to clear away but never saw. No one walking into that bar would have had any reason to think they were going to meet their killer that night, whether intoxicated or sober. It really is a, a case that's totally made by forensic evidence. So between the phone records, the DNA, and the hair and fiber evidence, together that's a trifecta of evidence that is the thing that proved him guilty. Next, the killer is hunting law enforcement. He's murdered right outside the courthouse. I was just amazed and shocked. Possible targets are on edge. I felt like there was a vendetta against law enforcement as a whole. This hit very close to home. That attack was very brazen. But the killer's own arrogance creates the clue that exposes him. We had our evidence. Just a profound sense of relief that we had our guy. It was kind of a mix of Christmas morning and the Texas Rangers winning the World Series. Kaufman County, Texas is close to Dallas, yet retains many of the down-home qualities Texans still hold dear. But proximity to Dallas is not without its cost, and Kaufman City, the county seat, sees more than its fair share of crime. It's kind of like Mayberry, but Mayberry with methamphetamine, maybe, and the Aryan Brotherhood. Just by being situated close to Dallas County, they get a lot of that big city crime slopping over their, their county borders. On a January morning in 2013, it was business as usual around the Kaufman County Courthouse. The time of day, this is the time when the courthouse really starts to come alive and, and the square itself comes alive. For Mark Hassey, a well-respected prosecutor, it looked to be a regular day at work. As Mark made his way to the courthouse, a man came up to him and appeared to confront him. Bush, a prosecutor and a former police officer, saw all of this as she was parking her car. Mark was walking toward the courthouse. As they got closer to each other, the person who was walking toward Mark shoved him. Within seconds, this became much more than a shoving match. The man who'd approached Mark pulled out a pistol, pushed it into Mark's neck, and shot him five times. Mark crumpled to the side. The shooter, who Lenda couldn't identify, ran to a waiting car and was driven away from the scene. Lenda's police training kicked in, and she followed the getaway car. There was not a license plate there, so I saw no number or anything. Lenda tried to tail the car, getting as many details on the make and model as she could, and then rushed back to help her friend. Police arrived moments later. Mark was still alone when I got there, and started giving him CPR and more importantly I started telling him that we're here we know what's happened and help is on its way but it was too late the courthouse community was a tight-knit group everyone was stunned by this murder it was horribly brazen it was horrific it was terrible the attack itself was in broad daylight right off a busy town square it was the murder was seen by a lot of people, but eyewitness descriptions, as is common, vary wildly. However, in this case, the witnesses agreed on one thing. The shooter was all dressed in black, even 
his face seemed to be concealed in, in some way, like he had some type of a, a mask on, but they really couldn't describe it. They couldn't put it into words. This had all the trappings of a professional hit. Someone had clearly targeted Mark Hassey, a prosecutor known for his scrupulous honesty. The assassination of a public prosecutor was a national news story. Investigators tonight combing through leads in a desperate attempt to track down the killer who shot and killed Mark Hassey. For Mark Hassey's co-workers, it was an unmitigated tragedy. The unmarried 57-year-old had put a lot of criminals behind bars. He was known around the courthouse as kind of the little lawyer with the big voice and just very tenacious and kind of a prosecutor's prosecutor. And it appeared that's what got him killed, which had his co-workers wondering if anyone else could be a target. People were concerned. Citizens were concerned. Law enforcement were concerned. Uh, it was the not knowing who's doing this, not knowing who's possibly next, and not knowing why this is being done. After the shot, murder of Mark Hassey, the point man on finding his killer, was Mark's boss, District Attorney Mike McClellan. We're going to find you, we're going to pull you out of whatever hole you're in, and we're going to bring you back and let the people of Kaufman County prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law. Mike took Mark's death very personally. It was on Mike's watch. And especially since it was right outside of the courthouse, Mike felt like he should have been able to protect him, been there in some way. Suspicion immediately fell on people Mark Hassey had put in jail. He prosecuted a lot of organized crime individuals, heavy hitters, gang-related type cases. So he thought maybe it might have been retribution for one of them. He tried a lot of high-level drug cases, a lot of very violent drug cases. A major focus was to look back at some of those old cases and see if anybody had paroled out or any of those guys that he had gotten so much time on still carried that level of vengeance that they would have him gunned down. In line with the theory that this was a professional hit, there was only one piece of evidence at the crime scene, a single bullet, apparently a missed shot. It was a kind of a unique type of ammunition, not one that you see a lot. It was a 38 plus P ammunition. This ammunition is built to be more powerful than a standard 38 caliber. Perhaps another sign the shooter was a professional. That bullet was fired from either a 38 special or 357 Magnum caliber firearm with five lanes and groups with a right hand or clockwise twist. Possible manufacturers, the firearm that could have fired that bullet included but we're not limited to Ruger, Smith & Wesson, or Taurus. Detectives poured over Mark Hassey's case files, looking for potential suspects. Then, six weeks after the murder, there was a nearly identical murder in Colorado. We begin them with the breaking news and the murder of Colorado's prison chief. The head of the state's Department of Corrections was gunned down on his front porch. Two days later, a car linked to that murder was found in Texas. The driver, 28-year-old Evan Ebel, was a white supremacist with a history of violence. He promptly shot and wounded the deputy who pulled him over, and then led police on a miles-long car chase that only ended after he crashed into a truck and later died. This bizarre series of events had a possible direct connection to Mark Hassey. He had put a lot of members of the Aryan Brotherhood a notoriously violent white supremacist gang in jail. So obviously getting into a shootout with law enforcement, somebody connected to the white prison gangs, we looked at him almost instantly as a potential suspect in this case. A bullet recovered from this shootout with police was consistent with the caliber of bullet recovered from the Hassey murder. But this connection quickly fizzled out. Evan Ebel was not in Texas at the time Mark was shot. It was a strange coincidence how all of this happened. Everything just kind of intersected at the same time. A lot of our county officials had protection. We didn't know who was watching. And I had two daughters that I wanted to make sure were safe. Nine days after the Evan Ebel shootout, a Dallas police officer paid a visit to the home of Kaufman County District Attorney Mike McClellan an old family friend. 
and what that officer discovered brutally confirmed suspicions that someone was after local law enforcement. This is a targeted event. It has to be. Somebody just doesn't come in your house and, and kill you in your own home for no reason. Mike McClellan was the hard-charging district attorney of Kaufman County. His wife, Cynthia, was a nurse who loved her role as the DA's at-home right hand. She definitely enjoyed kind of being the mom of the DA's office. She would bring in cookies, or if somebody was having a new housewarming or a new baby, she would make them a quilt. She loved hosting Christmas parties for everybody. The McClellans, like everyone in Kaufman County law enforcement, were on guard after the execution-style murder of Mark Hassey, one of Mike McClellan's top prosecutors. Everyone was definitely on edge. I mean, you had a first assist district attorney that was murdered right outside the courthouse. So I think it made everybody a little bit nervous as to what was going on and how they should proceed after this. C.J. Tomlinson, a Dallas police officer, had close ties to the McClellan and family. His parents had known them for years. In fact, he later married their daughter, Christina. On the Saturday before Easter, the McClellans weren't returning any calls. I had received a phone call from my mother saying that she was going to go over to the house and check on him because she hadn't been able to get a hold of Mike or Cynthia all day. At that point, I didn't think a whole lot about it. I said, okay, you know, go over there. CJ's mother arrived to find the house locked with the lights off and the cars in the driveway. Concerned, she called her son. Soon, both CJ and his mother entered the home and found a scene of stunning violence. Whoever did that was a monster. Whoever was was capable of doing that, walking into someone's house and shooting two people and an innocent lady that had nothing to do with anything besides being married to the DA. You're a monster. The McC- still dressed in their pajamas, had been shot repeatedly. Mike, 16 times. Cynthia, 8. And it was just a savage, brutal crime scene that just kind of screamed overkill when you looked at the crime scene. There was no forced entry. No one knew how the killer got into the house. But it was clear he had only one purpose. If I had to describe it, it was almost like a hunt. It was very concentrated on them. There's no doubt that he went in there with the intent to kill whoever was in there. There was no weapon at the scene, but analysts recovered 20 shell casings, which the shooter clearly didn't attempt to hide. These 223 caliber casings were consistent with bullets recovered at the McClellan's autopsies. On the bullets, we were able to look at those microscopic patterns and determine that one single firearm had fired all of those bullets. Potentially, investigators were looking for one firearm that was used in that offense. And that firearm was some sort of semi-automatic assault rifle. A piece of surveillance video from a nearby business raised a disturbing possibility that the killer might be a disgruntled member of local law enforcement. There was this one video that was captured near the McClellan's home, and it was an unmarked white Crown Victoria that was similar to a police car. That raised a red flag for us. Did Mike McClellan know his killer? Had he let a police officer into his home, not knowing he and his wife could be a target? No one had any answers, and Kaufman County had never seen anything like this before. To have two prosecutors from the same office along with one of their spouses gunned down in such a short time frame It just makes your head spin. I didn't have any context in which to put it. All I knew is I was scared. 24 hours after the McClellan murders came a possible break. Among the hundreds of tips that poured into the Crime Stoppers website was one that jumped out. This tipster claimed credit for the murders under a headline that read, Do we have your full attention now? The tip actually named the ammunition type in the Hashi murder, which did get our attention because until now it was only law enforcement who knew this. So it was either the shooter or law enforcement because we were the only ones who knew at the time. 
the tipster threatened to commit more murders unless a local judge resigned that week. Despite the tip, frustrated detectives were no closer to identifying a suspect until they found out something that Mark Hassey and Mike McClelland had in common before they were murdered. One year earlier, they convicted local justice of the peace, 46-year-old Eric Williams, for theft of public property. His case appeared to be the only thing that tied the murders together. But theft of public property is a long way from cold-blooded murder. It's a big stretch, for sure. Stealing computer monitors from the county IT to, you know, capital murder. Yeah, that's a big stretch. Just six months into Eric Williams' job as a local justice of the peace, he was caught on tape taking computers from his office. He said it was perfectly legal. He compared the uh, computer monitors with uh, toilet paper. He thought it was okay to go to the room and get toilet paper for his bathrooms in his office, so he just went into the room and, and took what he wanted. I don't think that you actually believe, I mean, you're an educated person, I see your class ring player. Uh, that you can just walk into a ID department and say, I need a monitor, I'm taking that one. I mean, there's places that do that. Places being here in Coleman County, or I mean, there's businesses that do that. It depends on how they run all their departments. Mike McClelland assigned his toughest prosecutor, Mark Hassey, to prosecute the case with him. Eric Williams convicted and got probation but the conviction ended his career and his life had been on an upward trajectory for quite some time and then when he was convicted of these crimes by mark and mike that was the first bad thing that had gone wrong in his life was this the vendetta feared by local law enforcement a criminal record and the possibility of revenge was enough for a search warrant in williams's house on a piece of scrap paper detective found a game-changing clue, the password to the Crime Stoppers tip line. Every time a, a tip is submitted online, it generates a unique password to that website. And Eric Williams, as the user of that tip, had a distinct individual password, and he wrote that down. One of the agents recognized that that was the password for the online tip we had been concerned about. So it was a good piece of detective work. When word got out that Williams was a suspect, Detectives got a call from a friend of his. He knew of a storage shed that might have a connection to the murders. Investigators descended on the facility, found a white Crown Victoria similar to the one caught on video leaving the crime scene, and that wasn't all. There were plenty of weapons that looked like AR-type weapons or 38 caliber 357s. That was an amazing moment. There's probably not words that would adequately express what felt like when we saw that door go up. Among all the firepower in the shed, the key piece of evidence appeared to be one unfired round, apparently left by accident. Everything else, all the other thousands of rounds Eric Williams had in that storage unit was meticulously put away and kept in place. He was a neat freak. But this one live round was found in the bottom of a tactical bag. And a fast-thinking FBI agent collected it packaged it separately and sent it to the lab. This live round had apparently been in one of Williams's automatic rifles and then taken out without ever having been fired. But when the bullet was put in the gun and when it was ejected, tool marks were left on the soft metal of the bullet's shell casing. I determined that that unfired cartridge had at one time been cycled in the same unknown firearm as all the fired cartridge cases from the and crime scene. Looking at those microscopic patterns, we determined that that unfired cartridge had in fact been loaded and then unloaded from the same firearm as the fired cartridge cases from the crime scene. The ballistics was huge for us because it put Eric in the home of the McClellans. There was one last question. Who drove Williams away from the Mark Hasse murder? Williams's wife, Kim, was questioned. When told of the mal- of evidence against her husband and that both of them faced possible execution, she immediately admitted she was in on the plot. 
She told us that Eric's pain was her pain, his joy was my joy. So I think she was his biggest cheerleader. She felt wronged by Mark and Mike, and she wanted payback just as bad as Eric Williams did. Kim Williams led police to a local lake where she claimed she and Eric disposed of evidence. Dive teams later found the mask Williams wore when he shot Mark Hasse. Also found were two guns, one of which was tied back to the Mark Hasse murder by ballistic analysts. Prosecutors say Eric Williams planned everything. At the McClelland home, he came in shooting, knowing his assault rifle would leave shell casings behind. What he apparently didn't know was that when he emptied the unused bullets from that gun after the murder and picked up those bullets, he missed one. And the bullet had microscopic tool marks that tied it back to the gun used to kill the McClellans. After the murders, Eric Williams and his wife celebrated with a steak dinner. One thing to understand about Eric Williams, uh, he's a psychopath that thinks he's smarter than everyone. Finally, his ego was his undoing. And that ego was on full display when Williams drove his Segway to talk to reporters shortly after the murders. My heart felt condolences go out to both the McClellan family and the Hassey family because they were in public office doing the right thing and for some reason that we're not aware of it paid the ultimate price for that. In December of 2014, Eric Williams was convicted of capital murder and got the death penalty. Kim Williams pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and was sentenced to 40 years. The murder left their mark on the community and might not have been solved if not for the microscopic marks left on the single bullet that finally broke the case open. This case would have been exponentially more difficult if we did not have the forensics. Even though we don't have the gun, we know the gun that was in Eric Williams' storage unit was the same gun that was at the McClellan crime scene. So that ballistic piece for us without that murder weapon was just absolutely uh, a home run for us.